Hello class, uh, welcome uh, to our Calculus 2 lecture for Monday, um, April 13th. Uh, by the time you uh, watch this lecture, I may be through uh, grading the test. I received uh, all of the tests, I think, from people who are still uh, participating in the class. So I've started grading those and um, I may be through by Monday, April uh, 13th. Uh, but in any case, um, when I do get finished, I will email you and let you know uh, that the um, uh, that the scores are posted, and I will also uh, in WebAssign the scores are posted, and I will also um, return your test to you uh, by email um, to the same email address that you sent uh, me the test from. Okay, uh, so uh, you'll get your test back uh, with your grade on it, and then um, uh, whatever comments there are uh, on the test, which aren't going to be extensive because I have to. Uh, I type those comments uh, in uh, to a um, uh, PDF form, and so that's a little bit awkward, but uh, your grade will uh, definitely be there on the test and, of course, also posted uh, on uh, WebAssign. Um, today we're going to uh, continue uh, talking about uh, improper integrals, which we started in last Wednesday's uh, lecture, uh, so I have a few more examples to do with improper integrals, um, and then we have another topic that's um, uh, kind of uh, 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 emanates from improper integrals uh, that we're going to talk about today called L'Hopital's Rule. L'Hopital, that's a French uh, mathematician, um, and, um, and that's a rule for evaluating limits uh, because, uh, as you will recall from last week, uh, limits are important in helping us, um, evaluating limits are important in helping us evaluating improper integrals, right? And so, um, and L'Hopital's rule is an aid in helping us evaluate certain types of limits. Uh, so we're going to look at that as, uh, today as well. Um, and then the only real homework that you do uh, have due this week, right, is trig substitution. So that's due on Wednesday at midnight. Uh, I know that uh, some of those problems are going to be uh, challenging. So I hope you've already started on that homework uh, so you can get finished with that uh, uh, by the uh, due date. But now don't forget, uh, if you're running past... Um, as always, right, if you're running past um, uh, uh, the due dates, you can always ask for an automatic extension. So I've relaxed the rules on automatic extensions a little bit. The, uh, uh, the rules are posted over here on the announcements um, on the right-hand side of the uh, website homepage. So um, don't forget that you can ask for an automatic extension and keep working on your uh, homework assignments, right, and still earn uh, points even if you're uh, past the due date. So I forgot to mention, I hope everyone is uh, uh, safe and well today. I hope you uh, had a um, happy Easter uh, yesterday. Um, probably wasn't very exciting because uh, really nothing to do, right? Okay, uh, but at least um, I hope it was uh, uh, okay for you. Um, all right, so uh, there's kind of uh, where we are in the class, right? And um, now I'm going to uh, resume here uh, talking about improper integrals and try to uh, finish uh, those examples. We had done a couple of examples last Wednesday, but now we've got some of the more challenging examples uh, uh, that we want to do, um, uh, and so these will help you with your uh, the harder homework problems in this um, improper integrals homework, which is not very long uh, anyway. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, let me switch back uh, to the notes, uh, right to where we uh, quit last time, and we were on this example, or we had reached this example. I don't think we'd started talking about it yet, but we had reached this example, so it's a very typical uh, improper integral example, right? Remember, uh, improper integrals are integrals where one of the uh, limits of integration, or maybe both, actually, we're going to see example here in a minute, where uh, both of the limits of integration are infinite, right? So um, in this problem, we're trying to find the area beneath this curve, uh, 1 over uh, x squared plus 1, but we want uh, the area uh, uh, starting at zero and then going all the way out to infinity. So it's just uh, here, uh, the instructions just say uh, the area beneath this curve for x greater than or equal to zero. So I've drawn a picture here of the situation, right? If you start at zero, uh, and uh, uh, since there's no upper bound here on x, right, uh, we're assuming uh, uh, that we're going all the way out uh, to the right on the x-axis. And you do have an area beneath this curve all the way uh, out to infinity, right, uh, beneath uh, the curve down to the x-axis because this particular curve, 1 over x squared plus 1, that's this uh, 
curve here on top of the area. Uh, this curve uh, doesn't have any x-intercepts, so it never cross, it never touches the x-axis. So this uh, a region here continues, even though it's a little bit thin, right? This region is going to continue uh, with some area all the way out to in infinity. It's going to be very thin, right, as you get further and further to the right. But there's still some area there all the way out to infinity on uh, the x-axis. So uh, uh, just like we were doing in the prior examples, right, uh, we're going to use an improper integral uh, to uh, compute uh, this uh, area, right, uh, of this unbounded region. And it's very easy to set up the improper integral that represents the area because it's just going to be a definite integral very similar to uh, any time we're computing the area beneath uh, the curve, right, uh, beneath the curve down to an x-axis. So we just write down this definite integral, right? We have our limits of integration. We're starting at zero, but unfortunately, the top limit of integration, right, is going to be infinity because we this uh, the, uh, this region extends all the way uh, to infinity on the x-axis, right? So uh, so what our top limit of integration here is infinity, and then of course that's just the formula for the curve, right? So that's just uh, a you know very normal uh, definite integral uh, to find uh, 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 the area right uh, beneath the curve, okay? And so what we have to evaluate this definite integral, right, to determine this area. But the difficulty with, as we discussed last time, right, with evaluating this um, uh, er, uh, this uh, uh, definite integral is one of the limits is infinite, right? Okay, so we cannot, unfortunately, directly evaluate this um, uh, definite integral, all right, because of this infinite limit. And so, uh, and so again, anytime you have an integral where one or both of your limits of integration are uh, infinite, then that's called an improper integral. And um, and so we were learning, of course, techniques for evaluating improper integrals uh, last time. And because we saw, right, that um, even though this uh, uh, region is unbounded, uh, 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 so even though the region ex uh, extends to infinity along uh, to the right along the x-axis, that does not mean that the area is infinite, right? Okay, the area could be infinite, but the uh, but uh, uh, but also the area could actually have a finite uh, value, all right? And um, I think actually that's what's going to happen in this uh, particular problem. We'll see when we evaluate this definite integral. Now, how do we? Uh, 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 evaluate uh, uh, improper uh, uh, integrals like this one, right? And so the idea is, remember, uh, is well, you're going to uh, 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 you're going to convert this to a proper integral, right? So you're going to give uh, this um, uh, upper limit of integration a variable value. I'm going to use b here as the top limit of integration, but uh, uh, b is not going to be infinity, right? B is going to be some number between 0 and infinity, uh, and then we'll evaluate the uh, improper integral, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, we'll evaluate the definite integral from 0 to b, and then take the limit as b goes to infinity, right? So we'll evaluate this definite integral from, it, rather than from uh, 0 to infinity, from 0 to b, and then we'll think about what happens as that upper limit of integration goes to infinity. So here's the uh, here's the scheme for evaluating the improper integral, right? Convert the infinite limit uh, to some fixed value, right? So call it what you like. Uh, here I'm calling it b. And then take the limit as that fixed value goes to um, infinity, all right? So we're going to consider the limit here as b goes to infinity. So, uh, uh, so the trick here really is to convert uh, this uh, uh, improper integral to a limit problem, right? But it's a limit problem involving a definite integral, not a, 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 a proper integral, right? Uh, uh, not an improper integral, uh, a proper integral that we can um, evaluate. All right. So, well, our, all right. So, uh, stop beating around the bush here and actually uh, uh, evaluate this. Uh, uh, this uh, proper integral, right? So that means we have to find the antiderivative correct of 1 over uh, x squared. All right, so let's see if we can remember how to find the antiderivative of 1 over, uh, I'm sorry, 1 over x squared plus 1, right? And um, I want you to notice there uh, that this is um, a, a perfect opportunity uh, uh, to use uh, uh, the arctangent function, right? Uh, to uh, find the antiderivative because here we have the reciprocal of the sum, right, of 
uh, two squares, correct? Okay, um, and so uh, uh, as you uh, did quite well on the test, um, I hope you can recognize that, oh, this is a perfect uh, opportunity to integrate using Arctangent. And I'm not going to go through all the steps here. Uh, the steps would be, you know, you're going to make a substitution, let u be x. That's not much of a substitution, right? And then also notice that the a value here is 1 because 1 is 1 squared. And, um, and so, you know, you can go through the steps of integrating this using the arctangent. And you're going to end up with um, a very easy um, antiderivative here. Um, uh, the antiderivative of 1 over x squared plus 1 is just going to be arctangent of x. Uh, of course, normally we would add on our arbitrary constant, right? But since we're using this uh, uh, antiderivative in the context of evaluating a definite integral, we can drop the uh, arbitrary constant, correct? Ah, so uh, so uh, what we have here then is that um, uh, 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 this uh, limit as uh, b goes to infinity of this uh, proper integral, right, is really just the limit as b goes to infinity of uh, arc tangent of x, right, um, evaluated from 0 to b, okay, and let's see, that's going to be uh, uh, the limit as uh, b uh, goes to infinity, right, of, obviously, arc uh, tangent of uh, b minus arc tangent of 0. And now we have to uh, think a little bit about our uh, 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 trig, right, and see if we can uh, figure out uh, what this limit um, is going to be, right, uh, that involves uh, arc tangent. Well, part of this is really easy because arc tangent of 0 is 0, okay? A and um, uh, uh, you, you can probably uh, recall that. Uh, 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 from uh, 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 just your knowledge of trigonometry, but I, let me point out here actually that I have a graph of the arc tangent function. We don't often look at graphs of inverse trig functions, right? Okay, but um, arc tangent uh, is one that it is useful to know the graph of uh, because it does uh, 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 occur sometimes uh, in antiderivatives, right? Like in this example. And so here's the graph of the arc tangent function. And notice right there at x equals 0, right, the arctangent is 0. So this value is 0. Ah, so that's nice. So I just have here uh, a, 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 an even simpler limit, right? I have the limit as b goes to infinity of just arctangent of b. So the only thing we have to think about it here is as your inputs get larger and larger, right, uh, as your x values get larger and larger, what happens to arc tangent, right? Um, does that just go to infinity, or uh, what value does that converge to? Okay, and here's another a case now where it's really helpful to have the graph of the arc tangent function. So again, let's look at the graph of the arc tangent function and let's see what happens, right, as our input to the arc tangent function goes to infinity. In other words, let's see what happens to this uh, blue curve right, as uh, uh, x, right, gets larger and larger. And notice that uh, that curve is not going up to infinity, right? Uh, that curve has an asymptote. It has a horizontal asymptote, right, that it approaches as uh, x gets larger and larger. And uh, so you can see it very clearly in the picture. This red line is the horizontal asymptote. There's a, a horizontal asymptote on bottom, too. But this uh, a red line here is a horizontal asymptote uh, to arctangent, right, as x goes to infinity. And um, it turns out that that horizontal asymptote is at y equals pi over 2. Okay, So the equation for this uh, horizontal asymptote is y equals pi over 2. Uh, this horizontal asymptote on the bottom, its equation is y equals minus pi over 2. Ah, so that tells us, right, as b goes to infinity, right, as our inputs to the arctangent function go to infinity, then the arctangent is going to uh, just to uh, pi over 2. Ah, nice. So um, you end up with um, a um, very simple uh, 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 area here, right? Uh, this area uh, beneath this curve. Um, is um, just pi over 2, okay?
wow, who would have thought that pi would end up being involved in that area, okay? But um, indeed it does, right? Okay. Um, so we have, uh, 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 again, here's another example, right, where we have an unbounded region, but you end up having a finite area beneath that curve, right? So even though that region is unbounded, even though it stretches to infinity, its area is not infinite. It, its area turns out to be just the finite value, um, pi over 2. Um, okay, so remember this little fact about our tangent function because it's really useful. Uh, as uh, x goes to infinity, the arc tangent of x is going to pi over 2. Also, as x goes to minus infinity, the arc tangent of x is going to minus pi over 2. That probably will show up in your homework. Well, I'm not sure of that, but it could. All right. Um, all right, so let's try another example. This one is mm, even a little bit more difficult. All right. Um, okay. So... Um, we want to find now uh, the area uh, uh, between uh, uh, this curve, uh, uh, 1 minus x times e to the minus x power uh, for x bigger than or equal to 1. So again, I've drawn a uh, picture of that area. And um, that just so that you can see it, it's this little thin blue area here. So no, by the way, notice that uh, this area is, is going to turn out to be negative, right, because it's below the x-axis. So when we evaluate this definite integral, right, that represents this area, so of course here's how you represent this area uh, using a definite integral. You're going to start at 1, right, as the instructions tell us, but since this area extends to infinity, right, um, uh, that means the upper bound on our definite integral is going to be infinite. So we end up with an improper uh, definite integral here, right? Um, okay, so um, uh, so anyway, there's a picture there of that area, that unbounded area, right, that we're uh, trying to uh, 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 determine its value, or maybe it's undefined, right? So uh, maybe this uh, area turns out to be infinite, but uh, the sign is going to be negative. So I do want to, again, just uh, repeat that, right? So when we end up uh, evaluating this uh, 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 limit here, which represents that uh, the value of that improper integral, um, we should come out with a negative number or maybe negative infinity. Um, all right, so again, um, I, I, I went very quickly there, right? Here's the improper integral that represents the, um, uh, the area, okay? So that's pretty easy to set up, right? And now we have to evaluate the improper integral, improper because the upper limit here of integration is infinite, right? So uh, again, we pull our uh, intermediate step here, right? Uh, we're going to convert that upper limit of integration to a finite value b, right, to start with, and then think about what happens as b goes to infinity. So we're going to take the limit as uh, b goes to infinity. So evaluate this definite integral using b as the upper limit of integration, and then you'll end up with an expression involving b, and then take the limit of that expression as b goes to uh, infinity. All right, so let's see if we can evaluate this uh, definite integral. And here we go again. Uh, uh, we have to find a uh, antiderivative, right? So we have to find the antiderivative of um, 1 minus x uh, times e to the minus x. All right, let me see if I can. Uh, I'm not sure if I have enough room up here to do this. So. Uh, I want the antiderivative of 1 minus x e to the minus x. And um, I hope when you look at that and you're thinking about that, um, I'm hoping that um, uh, the idea of integration by parts uh, will uh, occur to you, okay? Because I think uh, we want to find the antiderivative of that uh, uh, integrand because it's a product, right? So you notice it's the product of this expression 1 minus x times e to the minus x. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking integration by parts looks like it might be uh, a convenient way to find um, that um, antiderivative. Um, and if we use integration by parts, if we follow our scheme, right, and we follow our Li8 rule of thumb, right, 
to uh, choose U, um, well, we don't have any logs in this integrand. We don't have any inverse functions in this integrand, but we do have an algebraic expression in the integrand, and that is 1 minus x. Um, so I'm thinking we would let uh, a u here be uh, 1 minus x. Um, uh, I definitely don't want uh, to let, uh, there's no trig expressions in this integrand, right? And um, uh, we do have an exponential expression in the integrand. That's e to the minus x, but that's our last choice for u, right? So it looks like um, uh, our, our best bet here is to let u be uh, 1 minus x, right? And then that means that dv would be the rest of the integrand which is going to be e to the minus x dx. All right, let's see if that gets us anywhere. So if u is 1 minus x, right, if u is 1 minus x, then um, uh, that's not bad, right? That tells us that uh, du dx is minus 1, right? Which means that I think, uh, what does that mean? Um, I think that means that dx is minus du. Be careful with the signs there. Okay, that minus sign is going to uh, maybe be a problem. All right. So um, yeah, I think that's correct. So dx, dx would be minus uh, du, right? Okay. And then uh, now we have to find out what v is, right? And we do that by integrating. Um, e to the minus x dx, right? So let's do that. Um, let's do that down here. Let's see if I can block things off right where we're working. So uh, let's see. So uh, v is going to be the uh, antiderivative, right, of e to the minus x uh, dx. And um, so I'll let you go through the uh, steps there of uh, uh, doing the integration. But I think then that means v is going to be minus e to the minus x. Okay, so um, uh, 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 try that. Okay, uh, finding that antiderivative of e to the minus x, and you're going to see it comes out to be not e to the minus x, but minus um, e to the uh, minus x. Actually, all right. So there's the value for. Uh, there's the value for b. Now we're in great shape, right? So we can start filling in our integration by parts formula, which says what? Um, uh, that this antiderivative is going to be u times v. So that is 1 minus x, right, times minus e to the minus x, right, minus then a particular antiderivative, right? which is going to be what? Uh, v, here's V, right? Which is minus e to the minus x, and then du, correct? But what's du? Um, I think um, du there, right, was just um, minus 1, right? I meant to solve here for du instead of for dx. I'm so used to solving for um, we're so used to solving for dx, right, when we do uh, 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 integration by substitution. That I sort of do that out of habit. But what I'm really interested in is uh, the value of du, right, with integration by parts, which is minus um, uh, 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 dx, right? All right, so, um, so I get here uh, v times du but du is minus dx. So I've got lots and lots of minus signs here, but um, let's see if we can simplify this a little bit. So I'm going to keep the 1 minus x times minus e to the minus x, and then let's see, what's this? All, all these minus signs work out to be. This is going to be minus the antiderivative of e to the minus x, right? Okay, uh, uh, dx, because this minus sign and this minus sign will cancel each other, right? And but I just figured out what the antiderivative of 
uh, e to the minus x was just a moment ago. That's minus e to the minus x, right? So I get 1 minus x minus e to the minus x and then minus a minus e to the minus x because uh, minus e to the minus x is the antiderivative of e to the minus x. Wow. All right. So let's see if we can put all this together here now. So um, let's see. I'm going to do some... Um, I'm going to do some simplifying here. So I'm going to take the 1 minus x and multiply it times the minus e to the minus x. So 1 times minus e to the minus x is minus e to the minus x, right? And then take that minus e to the minus x and multiply it by minus x. So that gives me plus x e to the minus x. And then this is plus e to the minus x. But that's really nice because now these two terms just cancel each other. So I get x e to the minus x. Wow. Okay. There is my antiderivative of this um, integrand. So now we can use that. Well, I hope I did that right. So we have the limit as b goes to infinity, right? of, um, oops, through with the integration now, the limit as b goes to infinity of, again, my antiderivative now is x e to the minus x, and we are evaluating that from 1 to b, right? Okay, so um, let's see what's going to happen here now. So I get the limit as b goes to infinity of, let's see, um, b times e to the minus b, right, minus uh, uh, 1 e to the minus 1, right? Okay, so um, let's break this up into, uh, uh, let's look at this uh, separately now. These two terms, their limit. This second uh, term, right, does not involve b, right? Uh, this second term does not involve b. So we can go ahead and write down uh, what that second term is going to be. And that's going to be minus, of course. And then e to the minus 1 is 1 over e, all right? And... But this, uh, of course, first term does involve b. So now I have the limit as b goes to infinity of uh, b e to the minus uh, b, right? And uh, But e to the minus b is going to be um, 1 over e to the b power, right? So we end up with b over e to the b power minus 1 over e. And now I have to figure out what this uh, limit is, right? So what's the limit as b goes to infinity of b divided by e to the b, right? Uh, of course, this stays as 1 over e no matter what happens to b, right? Uh, but what happens to this fraction as b goes to infinity? Okay, now that's a little bit hard to think about, right? Because as b is going to infinity, notice the numerator is going to infinity, right? And uh, because b is going to infinity, correct? So the top is going to infinity. But now what happens when you plug in larger and larger numbers for b and you're taking e to a larger and larger power? Well, as you're raising e to a larger and larger power, right? Uh, e raised to a larger and larger power is also going to infinity. So we end up with this uh, expression, infinity divided by infinity, right, uh, in trying to evaluate this, uh, uh, th this first limit, correct? And that is a problem. I don't know what, um, what are we going to end up with there, infinity 
divided by infinity is that one or is that zero or um, is that infinity um, what's going to happen uh, 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 in this uh, limit okay so um, oh wow so uh, uh, we're just at the perfect place to introduce our next topic oh uh, um, we're going to have to learn something by the way before we can finish uh, this particular problem so hang on to this for a moment um, we have to uh, uh, there's one other additional uh, uh, piece of information we need before we can finish uh, this problem this sort of situation uh, uh, comes up quite frequently well, I don't know quite frequently but it comes up frequently when one is evaluating limits okay um, uh, uh, this uh, uh, quantity infinity divided by infinity this is called an indeterminate form and um, what that means is um, uh, it's very difficult to uh, 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 just uh, directly uh, uh, figure out what uh, uh, this uh, value infinity uh, 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 divided by infinity uh, really is okay um, and so uh, we're going to, and but these so-called indeterminate forms uh, occur frequently, or at least uh, sometimes, when we're evaluating limits. So what we need to uh, learn here uh, before we can finish this problem is, in limits, how to deal with these so-called indeterminate forms. Now, the reason we use the term indeterminate, I want to be clear about that, is uh, this particular limit could turn out to be infinity it could turn out to be one uh, it could turn out to be zero or it could turn out to be really almost any value uh, between zero and infinity all right so um, it's really difficult uh, 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 without doing some additional analysis to figure out what this uh, uh, the actual limit is actually going to turn out to be uh, could be zero uh, could be a, a one a, a could be uh, any other number uh, uh, besides one or could actually turn out to be infinity um, so uh, so we're gonna have to take a little bit of a, a, a detour here and uh, learn uh, some uh, rules that can help us evaluate these so-called um, indeterminate forms so uh, so put this on hold for a minute okay and uh, we'll come back and finish this example uh, but first I want to talk about limits and indeterminate uh, forms all right so um, what I just uh, told you here uh, uh, in in words is what's written in the text here uh, in the notes so um, let's just read that back so uh, 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 skim that back so again sometimes when you're evaluating limits by direct substitution that's what we were trying to do uh, in this problem right we were trying to put in larger and larger values for B right into this fraction and uh, we came across this expression, right? Infinity uh, divided by infinity. So uh, sometimes when you're tr trying to evaluate limits uh, by direct substitution, uh, you encounter expressions like infinity divided by uh, infinity. Or sometimes you'll encounter expressions like zero divided by zero. Okay? Um, these expressions, as I mentioned above, are called indeterminate forms because the limit may exist in these cases or uh, maybe it won't all right and so um, so we're going to learn uh, a little bit more about how to evaluate limits uh, when these so-called indeterminate forms occur right um, before we can finish uh, that uh, previous example um, what we're going to learn actually is a very nifty rule here called L'Hopital's rule I mentioned that at the beginning of the lecture and uh, so uh, again L'Hopital is a French mathematician and he developed this really uh, nifty rule uh, that's useful in uh, lots of circumstances for helping us evaluate these so-called uh, indeterminate forms um, all right let's take a look at an example though that that, uh, that is an indeterminate form that results in an indeterminate form but uh, you don't need L'Hopital's rule uh, to uh, uh, actually um, evaluate it okay so here's a limit and we want to find the limit as x goes to minus 1 of this expression 2x squared minus 2 over x plus 1 now uh, the way you've been usually trained again to evaluate limits is to try to evaluate this limit just by direct substitution right so just take the minus 1 and plug it in for x in uh, uh, your uh, in the expression correct 
But when you do that, notice what you get here is um, 2 times uh, minus 1 uh, uh, squared minus 2, right, over minus 1 plus 1. And notice that's going to be in the denominator 0, but in the numerator that's also going to be 0, okay? And as I already mentioned, right, uh, uh, that uh, is one of the so-called indeterminate forms. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in arithmetic, you can't divide zero by zero, right? This is not a real number. Um, but when this, but that does not mean that the limit does not exist. Okay, uh, when this uh, uh, sort of quantity occurs when you're evaluating a limit, uh, it's true the limit may not exist, but many times the limit does exist. Okay, so. Uh, again, uh, we're sort of scratching our head in, in this case as to uh, right now what this limit actually uh, might be, right? Okay, because of the uh, deter uh, because of the occurrence of this indeterminate form zero divided by zero when we tried to just substitute the limit value into the expression, correct? All right. Now in this case, though, um, we don't need anything fancy to actually figure out what this limit truly is, all right? Uh, so we don't need anything fancy to help us uh, uh, overcome this indeterminate form. Uh, actually, just a little bit of algebra is enough because I want to point out that you can factor the numerator and denominator in this uh, expression. So in the top, you can factor out a, a 2. So that leaves you with 2 times x squared minus 1 over x plus 1. And uh, then x squared uh, minus 1 uh, that um, factors again, uh, that factors as uh, x plus 1 times x minus 1. Yeah, see, x squared minus 1 is the difference of two squares, right? So it will factor as x plus 1 times x uh, uh, minus 1. And then notice, see, something nice happens here. Um, the x plus 1s you can divide out, so you just have the limit as x approaches uh, minus 1 of what? Uh, 2 times x minus 1. And now uh, you can evaluate that by direct substitution. So you can actually plug in uh, the minus 1 for x in this expression. And when you do that, you don't get this indeterminate form any longer, right? You get 2 times minus 2, which is um, minus 4, I think, right? Um, so this limit, uh, uh, this limit actually does exist. It's minus 4. Okay. Wow. See, we end up with this really odd value, right? It's not infinity. It's not zero. It ends up to actually be this specific number, um, minus 4. Okay. So the limit does exist. It's minus 4. But again, if you, uh, without doing the factoring, if you had tried to evaluate this by direct substitution you would have ended up with this expression that you don't know what to do with, right? Okay. Um, all right. Um, so here we were able to overcome this problem of the indeterminate form 0 divided by 0 uh, just by um, doing a little bit of algebra. Let me show you another example where also we encounter an indeterminate form, but um, uh, algebra helps us. All right. So look. Um, uh, if um, now let's take the limit as x goes to infinity of this expression. So this is a little bit more like the example that we uh, suspended there just a moment ago because we couldn't uh, evaluate the indeterminate form. So notice if you just try plugging in uh, larger and larger values here for x, right? Or you can think of just plugging in infinity for x actually, although that's a little bit not kosher, but uh, you can sort of uh, uh, think about that. Um, well, uh, 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 notice what's going to happen to the uh, uh, numerator is uh, the numerator is going to become infinitely large, right? So as x gets larger, 3x squared minus 1 also gets larger. Um, and uh, if you uh, look at the denominator, um, uh, 2x squared plus 1, as x gets larger, 2x squared plus 1 also gets larger and larger. So notice that, again, we have this indeterminate form, infinity divided by infinity. If we try to evaluate this limit, just by direct um, substitution, okay? But, um, so, we don't know, right? Uh, uh, we don't know if this limit exists or if the limit does not exist. Uh, 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 you cannot uh, 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 make any uh, uh, determination, right, if you encounter 
this expression infinity divided by infinity okay maybe the limit exists maybe the limit does not exist all right I'm going to show you um, something here now uh, that uh, I'm going to show you a little bit of algebra though again that uh, can help us out of this particular situation um, I'm going to divide um, everything in the numerator and denominator by x squared so if you divide every term in the numerator and every term in the denominator by x squared, um, you're not going to change the value of this expression, but you're going to make it look uh, different. Make sure you divide every term, though, in the top and the bottom by x uh, squared. So um, algebraically, that's okay to do that. Um, that does not change the value of the, uh, that does not change the value of the uh, expression. Now, it makes the expression look a whole lot more complicated temporarily, all right? So I divided everything here by x uh, squared. Now, the reason I did that is kind of obvious there. These x squareds now will divide out. So you get the limit as um, x uh, goes to infinity over 3 minus uh, uh, 1 over x squared and then divided by 2 plus 1 over x squared. And now, this limit you can actually uh, uh, evaluate by direct substitution. Because as x gets larger and larger, all right, what's going to happen to the numerator here? Well, nothing's going to happen to 3 because it doesn't involve x, right? But as x gets larger and larger, 1 over x squared is going to uh, 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 get uh, 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 close to 0, right? That's going to be essentially 1 over infinity, which is 0, right? 1 divided by a really large number is 0. And same thing happens in the denominator, right? You have 2 plus 1 over x squared, but x squared is going to infinity, so you essentially there in the denominator have 1 divided by um, infinity, right? But again, that is 0. So you end up with 3 minus 0, over 2 plus 0, which is um, 3 halves, right? So see, the limit does exist, um, uh, even though uh, when we tried to evaluate the limit by direct substitution, we got this indeterminate form, um, the limit does actually exist. It's uh, 3 halves. OK, um, so you see, sometimes with algebra, we can overcome indeterminate forms. Unfortunately, algebra is not quite powerful enough to get us uh, through every uh, indeterminate form. So uh, uh, that is the purpose of this um, uh, a rule called L'Hopital's rule, which is really useful and very easy to apply to help you evaluate limits when you have an indeterminate form. Okay, so. Um, uh, what are the indeterminate uh, forms? Well, so here's the statement of L'Hopital's rule. It does have some conditions on it, uh, but uh, frequently the conditions are uh, met. All right. So I'm not going to go through a statement of all of the conditions. But again, L'Hopital's rule is is necessary when you're dealing with indeterminate forms like zero over zero, okay, or infinity over infinity, all right? When these situations arise, uh, uh, L'Hopital's rule is helpful. Um, there are some other examples of uh, also indeterminate forms. Um, if you have minus infinity over infinity or infinity over negative infinity or negative infinity over negative infinity, these are also indeterminate forms that L'Hopital's rule can uh, help you with, okay? So if you are dealing with these indeterminate forms, then this uh, rule uh, is useful. Now, what does the rule say? I didn't mention. Okay, the rule is very easy to remember and apply. It says, if you have the limit, right, uh, 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 as x approaches some value of some numerator divided by some denominator, okay, then that limit is the same as the limit as x approaching the same value of, look, it's the derivative of the uh, numerator divided by the derivative of the denominator, these two limits will be um, the same, okay? Now, at first, 
it's not clear why that's going to be helpful, right? Okay, uh, but it frequently is because um, recall in many situations the derivative of a function is simpler than the original function, all right? And so sometimes by applying L'Hopital's rule, you will end up with a limit of a simpler uh, uh, fraction than the original fraction that you started with. All right, so you understand? Here, so here's the gist of L'Hopital's rule. If you have the limit of a quotient, right, limit of a quotient, limit of a fraction, that is the same as limit of the derivatives, uh, 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 the quotient of the derivatives. So let me say that. Uh, limit of a quotient is the same as limit of the quotient of the derivatives. This is a, a really a, a powerful rule, really useful in lots of situations. All right, we're going to look, look at examples of that, but I'm going to come right back before we get too far, and let's apply L'Hopital's rule to this situation, right? So we were trying to find the limit as b goes to infinity of b over e to the b, right? And remember when we tried direct substitution there, uh, you know, when you plug infinity in for b, right, you get this indeterminate form, which is exactly one of the indeterminate forms that L'Hopital's rule helps us with, right? Okay, the two indeterminate forms uh, are basically that L'Hopital helps you with are 0 over 0 are infinity over infinity. Okay, so when those two situations occur when you're trying to evaluate a limit, L'Hopital's rule is often uh, going to uh, help you. All right, well. Look, so let's apply L'Hopital's rule here. L'Hopital's rule says mm, this limit, okay, would be the same as the limit as b goes to infinity of the derivatives of the numerator and the denominator. What's the derivative of b, though? Uh, b is the variable here, so we're differentiating with respect to b. That's going to be 1, okay, right? And what's the derivative of e to the b? It's itself, right? Because that's an exponential function. So you get 1 over e to the b. Don't forget this, minus 1 over e, right? That's uh, part of the uh, um, limit. I mean, it's part of the uh, uh, indefinite, uh, uh, part of the definite integral. All right, now, but what now? Can we evaluate this limit? What's the limit as b goes to infinity of 1 over e to the b? Well, as b gets larger and larger, nothing is happening to 1, right? But what's happening to e to the b as b gets larger and larger? We already mentioned that's going to infinity, correct? e to the b is going to infinity as b goes to infinity. So you essentially have here 1 over infinity. That's not an indeterminate form, OK? When you divide 1 by a very large number, you're going to get essentially what? Zero, right? So we end up here with our answer being zero minus one over e, which is minus one over e. Ah, there it is. So there's the, uh, finally, there's the area beneath this curve, okay? It is minus um, one over e. Notice it came out negative, right? Because the area was beneath the x-axis. So uh, that's good. It came out negative. So that value is um, 1 over e. All right. Well, let's look at some more examples of applying L'Hopital's rule, and you'll see how useful uh, it is. Okay. Um, all right. Let's stop here just for a second. Let me take a little bit of a pause, and then we'll come back and finish our uh, L'Hopital's uh, examples, if I can get um, my recorder here to wake up, all right. Ah, there it is, I think. Ah, okay, so let's pause here. Okay, so uh, let's resume with some more examples of uh, L'Hopital's rule. All right, so uh, here uh, we're evaluating a limit. Uh, that's what L'Hopital's rule helps us with, right? So we're evaluating the limit as x goes to 0 of sine x over x. This limit is really important in Calculus 1. Um, you may recall this from Calculus 1 because this limit comes up when you are trying to derive 
the um, formula for the derivative of sine, which of course is cosine, uh, when you're doing that, um, this limit uh, occurs. And in calculus one, since you do not know L'Hopital's rule, right, then of course this limit is uh, very challenging uh, to uh, determine. Um, but with, uh, 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 but with L'Hopital's rule, it turns out to be easy um, to calculate. Um, all right, so um, now the reason uh, uh, you need L'Hopital's rule, though, is if you're, if you're trying to, again, evaluate the limit as x goes to 0 of sine x over x, if you try doing that with direct substitution, uh, well, you uh, just plug 0 in for x. You would get sine of uh, 0, which is 0, and then, of course, x being 0. You end up with this um, indeterminate form, right? And so, um, so again, see, we don't know what uh, 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 this uh, limit is by direct substitution because uh, 0 over 0 can actually turn out to be really any value. Um, all right, so, uh, but that is one of the indeterminate forms that L'Hopital's rule, uh, rule can help us with, right? Um, 0 over 0, infinity over infinity, and then also minus infinity over infinity, or minus infinity over minus infinity. Uh, um, that's when L'Hopital's rule is useful to us. Um, so uh, let's uh, apply L'Hopital's rule, which uh, just says, uh, okay, um, uh, take, uh, uh, keep the limit, but uh, take the limit uh, uh, as x goes to infinity of the derivative of the numerator and the derivative of the denominator. So um, what's the derivative of sine x, of course? Well, you know that. That's uh, instantaneously. That's cosine of x, right? And the derivative of x is 1. So we just have the limit as, um, not x goes to infinity, I'm sorry, x goes to 0 of uh, um, cosine of x over 1. Well, uh, 1, of course, doesn't involve um, uh, x uh, at all, right? So it doesn't matter what x is going to. Uh, 1 is going to stay 1. But as x goes to 0, what happens to cosine of x? Well, uh, remember, uh, cosine of 0 is 1, correct? So as x goes to 0, um, uh, cosine of x is going to get uh, closer to 1. So you end up here with just 1 divided by 1, which is not an indeterminate form, right? That is just 1. Ah, so this limit of uh, sine x over x as x goes to 0 um, is 1. Let's try this one. Here we're back to uh, 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 taking a limit as x uh, goes to uh, infinity. And again, we have this, uh, we have another indeterminate form, right? Because as x goes to infinity, well, obviously, uh, uh, as x goes to infinity, x is going to be infinity, right? So the denominator is approaching infinity. And as x goes to infinity, natural log is also getting larger and larger. So, um, uh, 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 so um, the numerator also is going to infinity as x goes to infinity. Uh, infinity. So see again you're uh, facing this uh, indeterminate form um, infinity over infinity. So this limit may exist or maybe this limit does not uh, exist. Uh, so, But again this is one of the indeterminate forms right that L'Hopital's rule can uh, help us with. So again L'Hopital's rule says oh no problem right I will just uh, calculate the limit of the quotient of the derivatives, the quotient of the derivatives. So what's the derivative of natural log of x? Well, you know that very well, right, from the beginning of the course. That's 1 over x. And the derivative of x, of course, is 1. So what we really have here is um, a much simpler uh, limit, right? We have the limit as x goes to infinity of just uh, 1 over x. So what's happening is x goes to infinity to 1 over x. Well, nothing's happening to the numerator, right? But the denominator is going to uh, infinity. So you have essentially here 1 over infinity, which is not an indeterminate form. That is 0. 1 divided by a very large number is going to end up being 0, right? So the limit is 0. See how useful? Uh, L'Hopital's rule is. Okay, so finally, um, one more example of L'Hopital's rule. 
uh, and then uh, 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 this will really be enough, I think, to uh, allow you to use it properly. So here we have the limit as x goes to, oops, minus infinity. Okay, so we have to be careful about this. x is going to minus infinity um, of x squared over e uh, to the minus x. All right, so... Um, so if we try uh, evaluating this by direct substitution, uh, uh, or if you try looking at the limits in the numerator and denominator separately, um, wow, what's happening here? Well, um, uh, uh, if you think of the limit as um, x goes to minus infinity of x squared, so if you're just looking at what happens to x squared as x goes to minus infinity, well, let's see. Uh, so you're plugging uh, more and more negative numbers in for x, right? So smaller and smaller negative numbers, we're plugging those in for x, but we're squaring them, right? So um, when you square a negative value, it's going to be positive, but we're squaring these really small negative values. So they're going to be ending up uh, as really large positive values, right, once we square them. So it looks like that um, the numerator is going to uh, infinity, right? As uh, x goes to minus infinity, x squared is going to be going to positive infinity. All right, so that's bad news already, right, uh, in trying to evaluate this limit. Now let's look at the denominator. So what happens? So we have to be very careful here because of the signs. So what happens is x goes to minus infinity of at e to the minus x. Hmm. Well, let's see. Um, e to the minus x is 1 over x. So x is going to minus infinity of, I'm sorry, is 1 over e to the x, right? e to the minus x is 1 over e to the x. But as x goes to minus infinity, you're going to have e to a negative number. So that gives you the reciprocal again, right? Let's actually plug that in there. So we have um, 1 over e to the minus infinity, but that would be e to the positive infin infinity, right? Essentially. In other words, you'd have e just to a really large uh, positive number. But that's infinity, right? As you raise e to a really large positive number, that's going to give you a really uh, a big value. So the denominator is going to infinity just like the numerator is. So that is an indeterminate form, right? That's one of our uh, indeterminate forms. Uh, infinity divided by infinity. But uh, let's see if L'Hopital's rule can help us with this. So we have the limit as x goes to minus infinity. Uh, this limit is equal to the limit as x goes to minus infinity of the quotient of the derivatives. So let's take the derivatives. So I have um, 2x in the top. And then in the bottom, I have, be careful about taking the derivative of e to the minus x. That's minus e to the minus x. So let's see. Can I figure that out now? So if you take the limit as x goes to minus infinity of this, well, let's, let's break it up again and see what's happening in the top and the bottom. So you have the limit as x goes to minus infinity of 2x. That looks like that's going to be minus infinity, right? As x becomes a really small negative number multiplied by 2, Still going to be a really small negative number, right? So this limit looks like it's negative infinity. What about this bottom? So we have the limit as x goes to minus infinity of minus e to the minus x. Well, that's this limit is almost this. This limit is almost the same as this one, correct? The limit as x goes to minus infinity of e to the minus x, except you have the minus sign in front of it. So you end up here with essentially minus e to the infinity, but that is negative infinity, right? 
see this will be uh, uh, this limit will be very similar to the, uh, this limit uh, uh, as x goes to minus infinity of e to the minus x that we calculated a moment ago a moment ago we got e to the infinity so this will end up being e to the uh, minus e to the infinity which is negative infinity oh so look um, Wow, this is uh, not good news for us, right? Um, uh, this limit, if you uh, uh, try evaluating this second limit, right, by direct substitution, you get minus infinity over minus infinity, which is another indeterminate form, okay? We don't know what this value actually is. But look, we can apply L'Hopital's rule a second time now. Because L'Hopital's rule also works for this indeterminate form, minus infinity divided by minus infinity. So let's do this uh, a second time. So we'll have the limit as x goes to minus infinity of, now let's take the derivatives again. See, we can apply L'Hopital's rule multiple times in succession. So um, what's the derivative of uh, 2x? That's 2. That's 2. And what's the derivative of minus e to the minus x? Be careful with your signs. That turns out to be e um, to the minus x. Ugh. Finally, now, let's see if we can figure out what is this. OK. All right. So um, yeah. no, let me not erase anything. All right. So now, can I determine this limit? All right, so look, um, I know what's happening to the top. As x goes to minus infinity, 2 is not changing, right, because it doesn't involve x. So the numerator is just going to be 2. What's happening as x goes to uh, um, a minus infinity of e to the minus x? Oh, well, we calculated that a moment ago, right? The limit as x goes to minus infinity of e to the minus x. Um, that turned out to be what? e to the infinity, which is, of course, uh, infinity, right? So it looks like uh, you get 2 divided by e to the infinity, which is a really large number, right? But 2 divided by a really large number is 0. Ah, finally. So this limit actually does exist, interestingly enough, okay? But it turns out to be zero okay that was very hard to predict uh, uh, maybe beforehand okay but um, but now using L'Hopital's rule right we can see that this limit actually exists but we had to apply L'Hopital's rule twice all right so um, there's a few examples uh, of L'Hopital's rule um, don't need a whole lot of examples because it's easy to apply when it uh, uh, when it works but remember you can only apply L'Hopital's rule right if you're dealing with one of these uh, 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 indeterminate forms, infinity over infinity or uh, 0 over 0. Okay, That's when L'Hopital's rule is useful. There are other indeterminate forms okay, uh, uh, in limits um, other than 0 uh, over 0 and infinity over infinity, but L'Hopital's rule is useful for these two uh, indeterminate uh, forms. Okay, well, it was really a lifesaver, right, when we were trying to calculate that area beneath that curve a moment ago, uh, and um, it helped us greatly. Um, and frequently, when you're doing improper integrals, uh, you're going to come up with complicated limits, uh, 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 and uh, and so L'Hopital is useful uh, uh, often in computing um, uh, improper integrals. All right, um, I want to show you another example of an improper integral, one more, and, uh, and then um, a, a really nice little rule that can sometimes uh, simplify uh, computing improper integrals. All right, uh, so um, th those will be our last two examples, and we'll come back and look at those um, in just a second. Let me pause again uh, before we uh, finish with those. Okay, so um, let's look at evaluating this improper integral. Uh, and notice what's uh, difficult about this improper integral, or what's different about this, is you have infinity in both limits of integration. Um, let me show you a picture of this um, the improper integral. Uh, this would represent the area beneath this curve, 
uh, 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 this improper integral represents the area beneath this curve e to the x uh, over 1 plus e to the 2x and if you graph e to the x over 1 plus e to the 2x you get this really nice uh, bell-shaped curve okay and um, bell-shaped curves like this one are really important in uh, statistics okay uh, in probability and statistics and it's often useful uh, to find the um, area beneath these bell-shaped curves because uh, frequently we use those areas to determine uh, probabilities uh, in um, statistical analysis. Uh, so you're going to encounter um, uh, um, uh, definite integrals like this one uh, in the study of uh, probability and uh, statistics. And you're going to encounter um, uh, uh, evaluating um, the, are, are determining the area beneath uh, such curves, okay, in probability and uh, statistics. All right, so um, uh, let's show um, how we can um, uh, evaluate this particular improper integral. Um, what you need to do is, since we've got um, infinity in both limits of integration, uh, what we need to do is to split this up into, uh, what we want to do is to split this up into uh, two pieces, okay? So um, uh, notice that um, uh, 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 you can uh, break this uh, this uh, area at um, really any value for x uh, that you like, okay, along the x-axis, and then uh, uh, evaluate, uh, uh, so pick a value x on the x-axis, and then um, uh, evaluate the area to the left of that, and then evaluate the area of, to the right of that, and then add those two areas together, and that would give you the total area beneath the curve, uh, uh, you know, all along the x-axis. Let me show you what I mean. So uh, let's uh, let's uh, pick here uh, uh, x to be uh, zero and break this area up at zero. So in other words. Um, I am going to, whoops, so in other words, I am going to, um, hang on a second here while uh, my computer wakes up. All right. So I am going to, uh, again, uh, uh, break this at x equals 0. So I'm going to rewrite this uh, definite integral as uh, the definite integral from minus infinity to 0, okay, uh, um, e to the x over uh, 1 uh, 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 plus e to the uh, 2x, and then plus the uh, definite integral from 0 to positive infinity, okay, um, e to the x over uh, 1 plus e to the uh, 2x, right? See, I'm going to break this uh, this uh, area beneath this curve, right, into uh, uh, two parts. Uh, the part from uh, minus infinity up to 0, that uh, corresponds to this definite integral. And then uh, the part from um, 0 up to uh, positive infinity, right, that corresponds to this uh, definite integral. And the reason I wanted to break that up into two pieces is because now notice that these two uh, 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 improper integrals, uh, right, they don't have um, infinity in both limits of integration. So these are more like the um, uh, improper integrals that um, uh, we, were, we were evaluating in previous examples, right? Okay. Um, and so we can evaluate them just by using, uh, you know, by setting uh, the um, uh, the infinite li limit of integration to b, and then taking the limit as b goes to either infinity or, in this case, to uh, negative infinity. Right? Okay. Um, all right. Um, now, uh, uh, so I so I uh, I've broken the problem up into two sub problems. I had this original improper integral. Now I've got two improper integrals that I have to evaluate, but both of them are a little bit easier to understand than the original uh, improper integral. Now I have an, I get another break here though in this particular problem. 
uh, and uh, that was uh, uh, the reason that I uh, chose to break this area up at x equals 0. But you could have broken it up at x equal 1 or x equal minus 1. That doesn't matter. But um, it was uh, fortunate that I broke it at 0 because notice that the area beneath this curve to the left and right of 0 are going to be the same areas, right? Because this bell-shaped curve is symmetric here about the y-axis, right? The, uh, 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 this area, again, to the left is going to be the same as the area to the right. So all I really have to do is evaluate one of these um, uh, uh, improper integrals and then just multiply it by 2, right? Okay, And, um, and um, that would be the same as you know, evaluating both of them and adding them uh, uh, together. So, um, uh, so that saves me a little bit of extra work, right? So I'm just going to evaluate the first one, although actually the second uh, was probably a little bit easier to evaluate. But um, I'm going to evaluate the first one and then just multiply it by 2, okay? So let's see if we can figure out um, uh, what's 2 times this definite integral from minus infinity to 0 of e to the x, um, 1 plus um, 1 plus uh, e to the 2x, right? And now remember, we're going to immediately convert that to a uh, limit problem. So this is the limit as uh, b goes to, in this case, minus infinity of um, uh, 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 2 times uh, minus infinity, uh, 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 two times the definite integral from minus infinity to zero of uh, e to the x over one plus e to the two x uh, dx. Now this two you can factor in front of the limit. So um, let's get that out of uh, out of our way there for a moment. But don't forget about it, right? So we have 2 times the limit uh, as b goes to uh, minus infinity of, again, uh, now we have the uh, definite integral from b to 0 of e to the x over 1 plus e to the 2x. Now I've got it in good shape where I can actually uh, start working on it. So uh, to start working on evaluating this definite integral, right, I need to first find the antiderivative of uh, e to the x over 1 plus e to the 2x. So uh, let's uh, do that uh, off to the side here a little bit. All right, so my machine is balking on me here. All right, so uh, let's go off to the side here and see if we can figure out what is this antiderivative. And um, I want to point out that um, the, uh, the way you want to think about this is notice that e to the 2x is the same as e to the x squared. Okay, So that's a really important observation to make. e to the 2x is really the same as e to the x squared. And when you see e to the 2x written as e to the x squared, then you immediately have an idea of how we're going to find this antiderivative, right? Because notice in the denominator here, you have the sum of two squares. And that suggests that we might use the arctangent, right, uh, uh, to find the antiderivative. So in, in fact, that's exactly what we're going to do. So let's make a substitution here. I'm going to let u be e to the x. And then notice if we do that, du uh, uh, dx, of course, is e to the x, right? Because the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. And so that means that uh, dx is um, du over e to the x. And so now when you make this substitution, you get, notice, um, e to the x over 1 plus u squared times du over e to the x, right, times du over e to the x. And so, uh, look, the uh, e to the x's uh, cancel out nicely, right? So you just have the antiderivative of du over 1 plus u squared, and that is exactly the uh, correct integrand uh, to integrate using arctangent, right? So this is going to be arctangent of, actually, it's u over 1, because the a value here would be 1. But of course, u over 1 will be u. So you just get arctangent of u here. And um, remember, arctangent, uh, remember u was e to the x, right? So we just have our 
uh, antiderivative as arctangent of e to the x. How nice there. So we get 2 times the limit as uh, b goes to minus infinity of, uh, what did I say there, arctangent of um, e to the x, and that's evaluated from b to 0, right? So this would be uh, 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 2 times the limit as b goes to infinity of arctangent of e to the zeroth power minus um, arc uh, uh, tangent uh, of uh, b. But um, I wrote something down wrong there. This is b goes to minus infinity, right? Okay, well, um, look, um, our uh, tangent, uh, e to the zeroth is 1, right? And so um, um, e to the zeroth is 1. So we have um, here um, arc tangent of uh, 1, right? But arc tangent of 1. I think is um, arctangent of one. I think is pi over four, isn't it? So here we get um, just pi over four, and then minus, and now we have um, arctangent of. Um, B, right? So now we have to think about um, what is the um, arc tangent of B as B goes to um, minus infinity, right? Okay, so um, what did we get there for, um, what are we going to get for that limit? Let's go back now, and I think, um, I think though we know what this is, right? Because if we, let's look back at, uh, we talked about this in our prior notes. Oh, so there's the arc tangent graph, right? Here's the arctangent graph, and what's happening to the arctangent as the input, right, uh, goes to uh, minus infinity. It looks like the arctangent is going to uh, minus pi over 2, right? Isn't that correct? So we end up here with um, Arc tangent of um, so we end up with this limit as just being um, pi over two. This limit, the limit as b goes to infinity of uh, uh, sorry as b goes to minus infinity of arc tangent of b is going to be um, uh, minus uh, pi over two. Did I do this right? Hang on a second. Let me pause again here for a second. Let me make sure that uh, I've done my uh, calculations here correctly. Yes, I did have a slight mistake in, in what I wrote down. Um, Let's resume at this point. So we have uh, 2 times the limit as b goes to minus infinity of arctangent of e to the x evaluated from 0 to b. So when you evaluate arctangent of e to the x uh, 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 here, uh, you get arctangent uh, uh, of e to the 0 minus arctangent of e to the b, right? Okay. 
And we're, again, we're taking the limit as b goes to minus infinity. Well, e to the 0th is 1, right? So arctangent of 1 is pi over 4, because the tangent of pi over 4 is 1. So that's easy to uh, figure out. What's a little bit harder now is what's the limit as uh, b goes to minus infinity of arctangent of e to the b. But I want to point out that as b goes to not positive infinity, but negative infinity, then e to the b is going to 0. Okay, As b goes to minus infinity, minus infinity, e to the b power is going to uh, 0. Okay, Because that's essentially the reciprocal, because b is negative, that's the reciprocal of e to a really uh, large number. But the reciprocal of e to a really large number will be 0. Okay, So you have a, 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 a pi over 4 minus arctangent of 0. But fortunately, arctangent of 0 is easy to calculate. That's just 0. So you get um, just 2 times pi over 4, which is pi over 2. Ah, neat. All right. So um, uh, uh, this total area beneath this curve, um, this bell-shaped curve, this side is pi over 4, and this side is also pi over 4, because the two sides are symmetrical. This is the one we calculated. Uh, since the two uh, sides of this area are symmetrical, this uh, uh, positive side is also pi over 4. Add those two together, and you get um, pi over 2. Okay, So the area beneath that curve is um, pi over 2. Um, all right, so um, I want to show you one more thing, a very easy, uh, a, a shortcut that you'll like this, okay? So um, uh, here's a special type of improper integral that occurs frequently that's very easy to evaluate. So if you have the improper integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to a power, then this improper integral, this type of improper integral, notice it's not 0 to infinity, it's 1 to infinity of 1 over x raised to a power. This type of improper integral is easy to evaluate. Okay, um, And here's the rule. So it turns out if this power is bigger than 1, okay, then um, the uh, uh, improper integral always evaluates to 1 over uh, uh, p uh, minus 1. So you can just skip all the steps. This is going to be the value that you get for the um, improper integral. On the other hand, if the p value, if this power is less than or equal to 1, including 1, then this improper integral diverges. That means that the area beneath this curve will be infinite. Okay. So uh, let's look at a, a couple uh, of examples here really quickly of this uh, using this particular rule. So suppose you want to evaluate the improper integral uh, from 1 to infinity of 1 over the fifth root of x. The important thing to notice here is fifth root of x means uh, x to the 1 fifth power, right? So you really have uh, uh, the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the 1 fifth power, right? Because fifth root of x is 1 fifth power. But notice that power p is less than or equal to 1, right? 1 fifth is less than or equal to 1, correct? So by our rule, what that says is that, oh, the uh, area beneath this curve is going to be, uh, from 1 to infinity, is going to be infinite. This uh, uh, integral turns out to be infinitely large. Uh, in other words, it uh, diverges. That's the terminology that the book uses when that integral turns out to be infinity. Um, so see, very simple to apply, right? Uh, but again, your improper integral has to be from 1 to infinity for this rule to apply. So let's try this one, right? Um, well, notice right here, you're, so you do have the reciprocal of a power of x, right? So it fits very nicely into the rule. The power here, though, is uh, bigger than 1, correct? Because 1.01 is bigger than 1. So that means then that uh, the value of this improper integral is easy to determine. It's just going to be 1 over that power minus 1. So you end up with 1 divided by 0.1, which I think turns out to be uh, 100, right? 
So you see you don't have to go through all the uh, limit steps, right, to evaluate this improper integral. Uh, uh, our rule tells us this is just going to turn out to be uh, 100. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, well, we've uh, used up quite a lot of time today. So uh, let me stop there. All right. And um, so don't forget about your homework that's due this week. Uh, there's only one due on Wednesday. That is the um, trig substitution integration homework. Right. Okay. Okay. So I will see you on Wednesday um, and uh, with a uh, new topic. All right. Um, uh, so uh, take care until then. As usual, right? Uh, wash your hands, of course, and um, wear your face mask when you're out around people, right? I think that will help uh, uh, you, uh, prevent you from getting sick. All right. See you on Wednesday. Bye.